Hi. Thank you for being here. I'm Robert McBride. This guy is Carlos Kalmar, music director of the Oregon Symphony. Hi, good evening. And what about this man in the middle? Well, this is Matthew Haber, who's here from New York to contribute something new and unique and fresh to this concert, and in particular to the last work on this concert, The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. That's why I wore this tie. I thought it was my best Rite of Spring tie. I mean, it isn't perfect, but it's good enough. So the big question on everyone's mind, Matthew, or my mind anyway, is what exactly have you created that we will see to go with The Rite of Spring? Yeah, so as part of the Sounds of Home series, and also, I don't know if it's formally part of the Sight Sound series, but it's certainly sort of in that uh, vein of, of work that Oregon has been creating. It's a multimedia response to the music of the Rite of Spring on the theme of the environment in sort of the broadest terms. Um, so it'll be a video projection uh, behind the orchestra and, and above um, that accompanies that last piece of the program tonight. Carlos, when did you first see the video? Well, actually, I have to say that I saw the in rehearsal, meaning... So, like, this week? And, and only partially. And yeah. only partially because I can't see that. Yeah. Yeah, it's... I, first of all, I mean, I can't see that because it's above any kind of vision that I have. <laughs> and second, as you probably know, during Rite of Spring, I'm kind of busy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For me, Rite of Spring, one of my top favorite five or ten pieces ever. Anybody else here feel that way about? Oh, yeah. Oh, excellent. Yay. Good to know. So how well did you know the Rite of Spring, when you got this gig? I had heard it. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, but not, not particularly well. So, what did they ask you for? Uh, they asked me to create a multimedia response to the Rite of Spring on the theme of the environment, and so, which was one of the sort of interesting opportunities this project presented was I've been allowed a, a very un, unusual and exciting degree of latitude to approach this work um, through my own process, and so that's been kind of fun. And I, I've had a year and a half, really, to work on this project, so I've had a long time to kind of let the music and sit with the music and revisit it and um, a, as my team and I sort of developed the imagery to go with it. Nice. And you went on a road trip around the state of Oregon gathering footage? Yeah, so part of, the, part of our process for creating the imagery for this was um, there, there was a desire for to have some sort of Oregonian nature in it, um, and Oregon has obviously much of that, and is is unique and unusual in the degree of um, like ecological diversity. So you know, there's not a lot of states where you have deserts and mountains and sort of rainforest type um, ecology, and so it actually lent itself well to trying to capture a, a broad range of of environmental imagery in one trip. So. Um, one of one of my associates and I spent a, a, about a week over the summer in a RV traveling the state, um, filming filming footage, which you'll see in sort of bits and pieces in there. I, if if you're looking for like scenic vistas of, of Mount Hood, you will not see that. But um, but but uh, much of that imagery sort of worked its way in various pieces, and and also served as a, a substantial inspiration to sort of a lot of how we thought about creating a lot of the other imagery. So, Carlos, do you have to match your tempos to what he did? On, on the contrary. The great thing about working with Matthew is that, of course, it's one thing you worry about. When you work actually with imagery or a ballet, you think, oh, my God, do I have to adapt whatever I can come up with? Because... Uh, as you probably know, um, even when we have only three performances, they will not be alike. Sometimes God knows what happens to me, and I think, oh no, this has to be faster, slower, and that can create, actually, uh, in something that is very visual, a problem, but Matthew was so kind to say, don't worry, we have... It's the thing... You have a way better way to explain it. 
this is, has nothing to do with a movie, but it's strictly timed imagery that travels everywhere. And because what you see above and behind the orchestra is a screen of a very particular shape and the imagery travels there and of course it has to travel exactly to the music. It's actually a very, very exact design, but it's more the other way around uh, that uh, Matthew um, and his team, they created something that actually can adapt. All that it needs is, uh, um, first of all, really good people who work all the magic up there, and second, um, uh, in this case, uh, uh, Norman Huynh, uh, my number two here in the house is also, he's probably sitting there calling out something. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's actually sort of the, the secret sauce actually is, is Norman's involvement. So uh, unlike a movie, which, you know, is just a single piece of imagery, this is many hundreds of pieces of imagery that all matches like which note it's supposed to go with in the score. And then Norman um, calls that show for us uh, off of Carlos's conducting. And so much like we do when we're doing uh, theater productions or musicals, which is my background, is, is designed for the stage. So it's, it's really based on that process and practice. But um, it's, it's hugely helpful having someone like Norman who really understands the music um, assisting us with that, for sure. Well, whose idea was this? I, I can't even recall who. It's not that it was this person. I remember actually the first time we shook hands was during uh, the process of Turangalila, if you recall that. So at that time we were already like, oh, and then we want to do the, something with Matthew. And I think it was even at that time very clear that it was right of spring. Yeah. And uh, so things came along. In, in our, uh, in the symphony, sometimes uh, program points are uh, originated in one brain, uh, but very often it's it's a result of a discussion, and this is a result of a discussion, and of course very clearly the, a result of our idea that the, this uh, this way of thinking about concerts in the modern era and what we started by doing the sound side series has to continue in some way, without at all repeating what was there which is also impossible because the artists involved are very different. I mean, all you can say is, uh, just thinking about Turangalina, um, visual artist. Visual artist, nothing to do with each other. That's the fun yeah, part. Yeah, they're both projection, but I think that's about where the that's similarity <laughs> is. Uh, and so. so it's sort of like Oregon Field Guide with the Rite of Spring soundtrack. Um, I, would, I would say it's, it's a visual response on the theme of the environment. I, I don't think it's so field guidey or Oregonian necessarily, um, but it, you know, it's it's a response to the music and it where the thread of sort of the environmental theme travels through that. I think I think most people will probably sort of understand it to be about the environment, but it's not like National Geographic documentary style. Um, for sure. So um. I'm getting more and more intrigued and excited about this the more that we talk about it. I know you have to take off and have something to eat before at some point, the yes. concert, but I wanted to mention I went to your website today. Right. And so here's this guy, Matthew Haber, who does design and, and, and video for, for operas and plays and, and all kinds of things. So you might think that he has this really highfalutin website with all this video and fancy stuff. No. A few pictures, brief bio, meh, that's it. That's, that's more because when I work on shows, I'm very busy working on the show uh -huh. usually, and so I get home and I'm like, oh, I didn't film it at all. So I think that's, that's more embarrassing than it is uh, like modesty, but uh, nonetheless. <laughs> No, I thought it was great. Here's somebody who'd rather be doing the work than telling us about doing the work. Yeah, I think that's true. So thank you for spending a few yeah, minutes, though, now telling us about doing the work, because now I really want to see and hear this stuff. Matthew Haber. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. See you later.
You don't mind if I get closer, do you? Go on. All right. Okay. So what about Bartok Violin Concerto Number 2? What does that have to do with home? Um, actually, I, I wanted just to add something to the equation, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very important to me when it comes to the idea of environment. Because the, um, if you think environment is just <laughs> a bunch of trees, a bunch of mountains, the sea, etc., and all um, the things that we do with it or against it, that is actually not how I understand uh, the idea of environment. And it's also not, the, the, not only how we, who created this series about sounds of home, understand the idea of environment. Actually, for me, the other part of environment is linked to uh, what we, mainly as humans, can create ourselves in terms of environment. And it doesn't relate to the fact that probably here in Portland, I know, we are all champions in that. Uh, we create great gardens. Yes, mm -hmm. wonderful. But um, environment is anything relating to uh, living together. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be you create a certain environment with your family in which the different parts of the family can exist. You uh, create a certain environment in your working place, be that as somebody who is... Um, it doesn't even matter in which part of the food chain you are. If you are the boss, maybe you have a bigger responsibility in creating a good and, and positive environment. Uh, but even um, a factory worker is part of what I call environment. Um, in an even broader sense, a society is an environment in which we all hope very much, uh, no matter where we come from uh, and what our background is, uh, that we hope to exist well. In that sense, I actually understand this concert as a, it's another arm of not only the sounds of home, but if I look back at the first concert that we did based on immigration, where it was somehow a not so hidden call for something called tolerance towards people uh, that come simply from very different countries, doesn't even matter where from, um, in this case, the, 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 the message, if, the, the, if you will, but I would uh, rather say the thought behind it, is way more hidden. It's something that uh, I hope very much we can kind of transport, because yes, it's obvious that if you put the right of spring in front of all of us and you put this amazing imagery with it, and the imagery is nature, in altered form, or you'll see it. It's, it's really interesting. Then, yeah, environment, duh. But, and this is where uh, people like me have to actually use words to explain. If you think about environment um, in a broader spectrum, as I was uh, talking about, you think about in what environment was Haydn's Symphony No. 70 created? Environmentally speaking, and not relating to nature, what was the environment of Bela Bartok? Even what environment was it when Rite of Spring had its premiere and caused the most horrific scandal in classical music? It was an environment. And probably, uh, just to talk about, I, I assume you know that if you don't know, uh, in 1913, uh, Rite of Spring was premiered in Paris, and from the get-go, it was um, received with hissing, catcalling, yelling over the music. It was, I mean, I mean, you look at it and think, that must have been so funny. I don't think it was funny. It was an environment. And the funny thing about that environment is you think, well, at that time, people were not prepared for the modern language of this piece. But that cannot be true. Probably the environment um, in which the premiere occurred of uh, Rite of Spring was manufactured because we humans are able to manufacture an environment. Because, matter of fact, after the premiere was biggest scandal, oh my God, the subsequent performances were very like, oh, and either the reaction was, I don't like it, or I think this is genius, meaning normal reaction to a piece of art. That is it. 
So in, in that sense, the environment uh, in which Bartok's second violin concerto was created, well, maybe not created, but what was around it was very toxic, very bad. Uh, I don't know for sure whether this is reflective in the piece itself, and it doesn't really matter. Sometimes it only matters to understand uh, a little bit in which circumstance does a composer, an artist in general, live uh, when he creates something. And uh, in certain cases you might be like, oh my God, uh, the circumstances of this person were so horrible, but he, she managed to create something very happy. It's called art after all. <laughs> Uh, and in Bartok's case, uh, later 30s in Hungary, uh, Bartok was very, very angry with his countrymen because his countrymen, and he said it himself with the words that the, the Catholic educated people are now all Nazis. I am ashamed because my own uh, background, Bartok's background, is exactly that. Catholic educated. But they were all Nazis at that time and that is a toxic environment and we know what happened later of course. And uh, he at that time thought about emigrating, which he did. Uh, emigrated to the yes. But on the brighter side he kind of was asked to write a concerto and uh, for a friend. Um, who was the, the, the principal violin of the Hungarian string quartet. And he did so. He wrote a concerto. And the fact that we now know, is, know it as concerto number two by Bela Bartok is, in a way, even historically speaking, completely immaterial because Bartok labeled this concert as concert for the violin. He didn't say this is my number two because, yes, he had written a number one long, long ago, which he didn't even consider a real concerto. Never mind, that is not important. Maybe important is also this, uh, so this sense of oppression that happens, and Bartok goes and writes a piece that is very typical of him. Uh, on one side, deeply rooted in somewhat folkloristic elements, but not, in this case, using real folklore from Hungary. But you understand kind of the, the language of his country. And on the other side, also, he... <laughs> when he talked to uh, Michal Sekli, who is the valence for whom he wrote this piece, um, he said, I want to write actually more than a normal concerto, I want to write a theme with a bunch of variations. And Seke said, like, do we really have to write that? Can it please be a normal concerto of sorts? And Bartok said, okay. And then he writes this piece. They play it for the first time uh, in concert. Premiere happens. And finally, Bartok reveals, you know, I actually uh, did something for you, I wrote a real normal violin concerto and I did something for myself because this concerto, you might not hear it immediately, but it's a set of variations. That's how the concert works. Which, just to be very clear, um, you know how variations technically work. You put a theme in front of everybody and then you spin off the theme and sometimes you go, pretty far away and then you return and la, la, that's how variations usually work. Please do not, when you listen and enjoy this piece, do not look for that because the variations are so hidden that even the violinists at the premiere didn't know it's a set of variations. <laughs> but all in all this piece, um, this is a violin concerto that every time I have the honor and pleasure of conducting, I think, uh, I mean, this is not a piece that enjoys less esteem than it should. I mean, this is regarded as one of the great uh, violin concertos of the 20th century. However, I always think like, my goodness, this piece is absolutely stunning. The bad news, <laughs> if any, is 
It's so difficult. It's really hard. Starting with the violin, but of course we have in Elina Behele um, a soloist whom you know. She has been here many times and she can definitely play it. But also for the orchestra and the conductor, it's a hell of a ride. So in that, in that think, if you create, if you think about the idea of uh, environment, you can blame me for creating a really difficult environment for the orchestra in this concert. Because right of spring, everybody knows, hell of a ride, Bartok, hell of a ride, and Haydn, Haydn is really difficult for a very different reason. I've learned more about Haydn from you than any other source because you love the guy's music so much and you've programmed so much Haydn here and we've talked about it. But I didn't know the Symphony Number no. 70 and it's fabulous. The last movement is incredible. It's a lot like the last movement of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony where there's this theme here and then it's over there and then it's over here and there's all this kaleidoscopic stuff going on. He was kind of showing off his brainy side but definitely a sense of humor is in there too as it always is with him. Well, that's always the problem with Haydn, that it is, it's actually, it's always fun. It lacks, to some extent, it lacks drama. I don't know whether this symphony lacks drama per se, but um, when it comes to real classical music, Haydn, Mozart, sometimes Schubert, Beethoven, rarely. But you always look at it and you can, if you are a musician, maybe in your brain do an exercise which is, okay, you know the piece very well, fine. And now strip it off all this stuff and just think about the pure melodic line. What's the melody? And in those cases, and this symphony in part, first movement, great example, you are like, Wow, it's the simplest of the simplest and even simpler than that. In a way you can say every idiot can write that theme. But no, exactly, that's the point, no. We, and uh, I, I remember, for example, that once I was in a lecture by uh, the great pianist and, I mean, he, he's a brain, uh, Robert Levin. And Robin, Robert Levin, the lecture, the theme of the lecture was uh, why should we care if classical music dies? And R Robert, being Robert and knowing way too many things, essentially talked about something very different. It doesn't even matter. You just listen to this guy and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Anyway, so, and just to make a point about uh, what Robert actually talked at the end is something that I always try to convey, even with my own words, which is the excellency of some classical composers and why it is great to differentiate them from other classical composers who are also good. Why is Mozart just a tiny bit better than Dittersdorf, or why is Haydn probably miles beyond Karl Stamitz, who is a great composer, etc., etc. And Robert said, well, listen uh, to, there's a Mozart piano sonata. It starts with tam pam 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 pim pam pam ta 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 ti ti, which is nothing but the notes of the, the major chords. And he plays that and he says, and now I'm going to play you that, how Salieri would have worked with that theme. And he plays, and essentially it was cute and nothing happened in the music, nothing. And then you play how Mozart does it and you think like, ah, major piece of art. And exactly that is what happens with Haydn. First movement of this, pam pam, Pom, 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 pom. Okay, that, that, it's a D major chord. Big deal. Yeah, but how he does it and what he does with just a chord. It's just stunning. And yes, sure, then 
Mr. Haydn feels the urge to kind of show off in the last movement because it's heavy counterpoint, that moment. Amazing piece. The, the only criticism I have for this symphony, mainly for the last moment, yes, I can say something critical of Josef Haydn, which is, it's just too short. <laughs> can we please have a little more of it? Because it's... It's, it's fugal, it's counterpoint, it's, it's in itself complex and witty and still has humor. And it starts in minor key, which is unusual for that time, and then it ends in major key. And once we are in major key, within 35 seconds, it's gone. It's gone. And it's gone uh, with kind of a little wink. It's like even the ending is so, in itself, so humorous. And just spinning back to the idea of environment, the environment in, uh, in which Haydn's Symphony No. 70, which has no name, was written, was a, an environment of probably comfort, sort of happiness, and definitely expectation, because that is an environment. Because the expectation was we, meaning the entire family of uh, the Count Nikolaus Esterhaz and all his employees, including the music director by the name of Josef Haydn, are in great expectation because we are going to build a new opera house on the estate of Esterhaz. And that is the environment uh, in which this symphony came uh, to be. And I, in a way, to circle back, that is why I kind of needed to add this idea of environment so that the idea of environment goes beyond nature. Nature is just a part of it. And yes, on this day and age, uh, when we have a lot of snow and ice in a part of the country, we think of all about environment when all of a sudden in the summer, I wasn't here, I was lucky. In Portland, it is 110 degrees warm and nobody has air conditioning. Well, it's environment. Yeah, sure, but it goes beyond that. Who wound him up? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was me. Thank you for making this the easiest pre-concert conversation <laughs> I've ever done. And you're right about environment. It's all kinds of things. And this is our environment now. And you are going to make it very beautiful with all of your comrades on this stage on your behalf. Thank you for being here. Carlos Calmer. Robert McBride. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stay and talk to Joe.